technical manager of LaFour. My name's Daniel. And uh, today I'm going to talk about aging tannins and how you can protect and enhance the wine uh, with these tannins. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the, the uh, tannin itself and how the, the function and, or the form of tannin uh, gives function uh, in the process, how you can add these tannins to your wine, uh, a little bit about the current research that we have going on, um, and uh, how you can do your own research uh, at your at your bench in your garage or um, at your uh, at your winery. So let's uh, let's get going here. Uh, first, I am going to talk a little bit about uh, tannin itself. So uh, tannins are polymers of the simple phenols, uh, which are usually classified as flavonoid or non-flavonoid uh, structures, but uh, the phenol itself uh, consists of the aromatic ring and a single hydroxyl group that you can see there. Uh, if you were here for our uh, our fermentation tannin uh, webinar, this is going to be a little bit of a, re of a review. Um, but let's just talk a little bit about tannins and how these uh, how these uh, phenolic compounds uh, affect the wine and how they how they work. So, <clears throat> catechin is an example of a flavonoid. Inside a flavonoid, there are two rings that look uh, that look the same. Uh, it's the ring on the left and the ring on the right. Uh, those uh, are your A and, and B rings. And then the uh, ring with the oxygen in the middle, that's your C ring. Um, and so the way that uh, the way that these molecules polymerize uh, is highly dependent upon the structure. And those structures uh, give rise to astringency inside the wine. So when you uh, when you want to add a certain type of astringency or a certain type of mouthfeel, um, you can utilize a blend of these tannins, or you could utilize uh, a specific type of tannin to give your wine that specific character that you're looking for. Um, so flavanols or flavin um, they are found in uh, vitivinifera and uh, the grapes. Um, most of the time, these, these compounds will uh, begin to leach from the skins within the first two or three days of uh, the fermentation. Um, and so these subunits, like I was saying earlier, uh, these subunits give rise to, um, to different flavor compounds and different uh, tactile sensations inside your mouth. Um, there under the uh, flavanols there, you can see how I was talking about that A ring, the B ring, and the C ring. Um, oftentimes, they'll incorporate uh, a glucose or a sugar moiety um, on that C ring. Um, and uh, quercetin and syringetin down there at the bottom, those six glycones at the bottom, uh, those two are are known for increasing uh, texture related to a velvety, a velvety mouthfeel, so um, or a velvety astringency. So we we do a lot of studying and we do do research. We have uh, we have our own research arm at Lafour. Uh, we um, and so we do we do a lot of a lot of work in you know blending tannins and and bringing these things together to give uh, to give you guys uh, insight into how you can utilize these tannins in your wine. There's two primary classes of tannin, hydrolyzable and uh, condensed tannin. Um, today, we're going to focus a little bit on the elagic acid component of, of tannin and how you can utilize elagitannin um, during aging. Um, elagitannin uh, is found in in barrels, uh, but it's also found in the grapes. So the, the hydrolyzable tannins are, are found in the skins and the pulp, but you can also find those in, um, in uh, wood sources as well. Um, the condensed tannin, um, it consists uh, of the, of the um, flavanol structures uh, and oftentimes will incorporate an anthocyanin uh, and so those are the, the pigments that you get from, from the grapes uh, themselves. Uh, Malvidin uh, is a very uh, well-studied uh, anthocyanidin. Um, the, 
that uh, has been studied really, really uh, in depth. But you can see the sugar moiety there uh, attached to the R group of the C ring. Um, I don't want to get too deep into this. There's a lot of stuff that happens. Uh, this is more on the fermentation side. Uh, you can utilize tannin to stabilize color via some acid aldehyde bridges. But today, um, we're going to kind of scan through the, the anthocyanin derived pigments. The important thing to know is that you can uh, utilize these structures to elongate and to uh, increase the mouthfeel of your of your wine. Um, Using the or going through the formation of, of polymeric pigments and, and things like that. Um, let's talk a little bit more on the practical side or the the applied side. Um, now that we've kind of gone gone through some some basics, so why do you guys want to use these tannins? Uh, well, uh, in many cases, uh, you want to have a wine that's ready to drink and full bodied. You want to limit the the aging time that's required. Um, there are a lot of reasons to add tannin. Uh, fermentation tannins you can you can kind of help with some lactase activity. Um, uh, ripeness is another reason uh, that you'd want to add some tannin to it. Um, so let's talk where about where the tannins can come from. The grape seeds and the skins are are really uh, the greatest place to get to get the tannin, uh, and you can design your extraction protocols during harvest with pump overs and punch downs to kind of extract that stuff. But you can also get it from cabracho bushes, uh, exotic woods, oak, um, gallnut tannins. Even the scars on the on the oak trees possess uh, different compositions of uh, of uh, phenolic material or tannins. Um, generally speaking. Uh, the benefits for uh, adding tannin in wine is that you're going to increase the texture and the mouthfeel. Um, you can enhance the aromas. Uh, you can stabilize the color via those acid aldehyde bridges where um, you're, you're not going to, the color is not going to drop out because you've uh, created a bridge between, uh, between the catechin uh, molecule. There's also some antioxidant protection. So if you're utilizing your, if you want to do low sulfur, um, we have some products in fermentation that will help you minimize the amount of sulfur that you need to add uh, for microbial stability. However, um, sulfur is not only a powerful uh, tool against microbial spoilage, Sulfur is also really good as an antioxidant. So you add sulfur to prevent the wine from oxidizing. So if you want to add less sulfur uh, during the aging process, you can add tannin and the tannin will uh, scavenge or consume the oxygen, uh, thereby uh, uh, preventing the oxidation uh, from happening inside your wine. So um, we're doing uh, an experiment now where we're looking at the redox potential of the wine and how we can incorporate uh, redox potential as a way to look uh, at, as a process parameter for the addition of tannin. And I'll show you a little bit more about some of the experiments that we've done uh, in tannin isolation and how you can add tannin in small amounts uh, during the course of aging to prevent oxidation. Um, it also binds with lacase so you can help uh, uh, remove the, the off uh, character that you get during fermentation uh, with heavily, uh, heavily botrytis uh, fruit. Um, all of our tannins are instantly dissolving. So there's a patented drying technique that we use that uh, makes the tannin very, very much like instant coffee. Um, and the tannin doesn't have the tendency to clump up on your whisk or to, you don't have to scrape it off the side of your bucket anymore. Um, we've gotten much better at uh, getting the tannin integrated into the wines. Um, 
Let's talk about aging tannins uh, in specific, uh, specifically. So uh, we talked about fermentation tannins just before harvest. Uh, we're moving into the elevage period or the aging period of uh, the barrel aging period of your wine. Uh, there are finishing tannins, but we'll we'll kind of stay in the middle here with the aging tannins. Um, oftentimes, you'll want the aging tannin to to integrate into the wine. Uh, we suggest. Uh, six weeks, so it's a moderate activity. They're not highly reactive. You're not trying to secure uh, the the color that's there. Um, you're just trying to uh, to to kind of put the wines uh, in a protective state, um, and you know, kind of minimize some of the some of the impact, uh, the the negative impact that you may have there, like uh, vegetal character. Um, you can stabilize color, but this isn't the optimal time to do that. If you wanna, if you wanted to get color, you should have gotten that in your extraction. Um, but this will uh, this will stabilize the color as well, um, and it does possess the antioxidant uh, capacity. For uh, the aging channel will help with that as well. So um, these dosage rates are a lot smaller or considerably smaller than what you'll see in a fermentation tannin. So a fermentation tannin can be uh, 350, 400 ppm. Uh, these are uh, lower, and then you'll see in finishing tannins, they're even lower. So these are, it's a moderate uh, addition rate. <clears throat> um, so we did, we did some, some trials. We'll talk a little bit about the experiments that are, that have been done uh, and that are, that we've done um, and that are happening inside the U.S. Uh, this was the oxygen consumption rate study. And what we found was, what we found was that their tannins that are most responsible for consuming oxygen during aging are oak tannin and chestnut tannin. And we compared this with, uh, I think, over 30 different types of, of tannin that are currently available on the market, uh, including uh, sea tannin, grape tannin, cabracho tannin. And we found that the oak and the chestnut uh, tannins are uh, consuming the most amount of oxygen. So during aging, if you want to prevent oxidation, uh, using uh, a tannin derived from oak or a tannin derived from chestnut uh, is, is, a good, is a good idea. Um, there are some other studies that have been done. <clears throat> uh, Washington State University recently, uh, or a couple of years ago, did one. Uh, Carolyn Ross uh, did a study where she looked at the impact of tannin, ethanol, and fructose concentration to see uh, if those things were correlated um, and found that um, an increase in the amount of tannin that you add will uh, increase the aromas and flavors of wittiness and the uh, mouthfeel sensations of bitterness and burning, so astringency. Um, and so um, these studies were really significant, and it sounds like it's a no-brainer. You add more tannin, and it's going uh, it's going to taste and smell more woody uh, and feel more astringent in your mouth. Um, but the study was really important because um, it was a correlation study and indicated uh, it was kind of it was designed to look at the matrix effect uh, of this of the wine itself. So it's a really complex system, um, but adding tannin uh, can help if you design your tannin additions for what kind of problems you might be having. And if you have an issue or something. Uh, that you want to talk about, you can you can always call us and we can help you find the tannins that you want, um, or we can send you a sample pack, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, um, where you can examine the tannins for yourself. Um, aging tannins are great for for the structure and ageability. Um, we suggest that you do do a tannin analysis with ETS. Um, to kind of get some numbers and find out what your baseline is with the redox experiment that we're looking at. Um, we uh, are utilizing ORP or redox probes to examine uh, that. I know that not everyone is going to have those. Um, 
But there are several different assays you can do. Harbertson, uh, also at Washington State, uh, designed uh, an assay. Uh, but these samples are, are these uh, analyses are, are not that expensive. Um, if you live in Virginia or a place where, um, where you can't get these, you don't have to do this, but we would recommend that you do a, a sensory evaluation after malolactic fermentation is complete. So get together with your staff and taste the wine. Uh, and I'll give you some guidelines on how to perform a sensory panel um, in house. Uh, the most important thing is that you all have the same language or the same uh, lexicon. But first, let's talk a little bit about the products. Um, VR Grape uh, is really good for increasing tannin and low tannin wines. It can also be used as a fermentation tannin. And the cool thing about VR Grape is that it comes from uh, grape comes from grapes, so grape skins and seeds um, is really good at stabilizing uh, the color via that uh, catechin anthocyanin and binding, uh, utilizing the acid aldehyde bridge. Um, it also enhances the wine structure. Uh, and when you're not using it in fermentation, if you're going to use it in aging, uh, you can kind of bring the dosage back a little bit. Um, the next one, Tancor Grand Cru is a blend of elagic and condensed tannin. So this is a blend of those oak tannins that we talked about at the very beginning, that uh, those elagic tannins um, that are responsible for uh, oxygen scavenging. You can utilize this product uh, in micro ox. So it's really powerful. Um, it is great if you wanna build a wine that's highly structured. You wanna add some structure to like a Cabernet Sauvignon or uh, something like that <clears throat> uh, really kind of elevates that mid palate. Um, also provides antioxidant uh, protection. Uh, Tancor Grand Cru is uh, one of my favorite tannins. Um, it's just um, it's a really great blend, and uh, blending the components of the of the tannin allows us to have a, a more broad uh, functionality of the tannin itself. Rare tannin. Um, is uh, can also be used uh, as a aging tannin. Um, the source material for, for the regular Quartanin is 100% French oak. Uh, we also have Quartanin chalk, uh, Quartanin intense, uh, Quartanin sweet, um, and Quartanin plus. And those uh, all contribute different, um, different characters to the wine. Um, the intense has a really uh, toasty character uh, the plus is an, is uh, is got is uh, derived from American oak, so um, you can you can get those and you can kind of take them and and put them on the bench and run trials and figure out which wine you you uh, prefer uh, and even blend them if you wish. Um, Quartanin is great at refreshing a tired wine, uh, and it does give some mid palate structure. Um, we're going to look at queer tannin uh, with the uh, redox probes and see how queer tannin works as an oxygen scavenger. Um, we're working on that now and hoping to have some results uh, later in the springtime. Um, we did a study where we looked at the amount of elagitannin uh, that's in a new barrel versus uh, once used and then the second the second use. Um, and you can see on the graph that the elagitannin is decreasing over time. Uh, that makes sense as you use a barrel. The first year, it's got a lot of character and imparts a lot of character into the wine. Um, but as time goes on, the barrel becomes more and more neutral. Uh, if you're working with a neutral program, that's great. But if you um, if you need a little bit more of that, uh, that character and you want your barrel to be against oxidation or premature oxidation of the wine, adding a little bit of quercetanin uh, every month or so, or during topping or during racking uh, can really help the wine. I also wanted to talk a little bit about the white wine tannin options, um, because not a lot of people know that you can add tannin to white wine. Uh, what it does is, is it helps with those, um, the oxidized character or a tire, tired aromatics, um, and it gives a gentle uh, texture boost as well. 
Um, we have two products that, uh, that we suggest, uh, or two lines, the Glalcool line and the Tan Fresh. Um, uh, both of those are going to really help with the, with the aromatics and kind of refreshing the, the tired wine. So I just wanted to briefly mention those because um, I think a lot of people don't think about adding tan into a white wine. And it's certainly something that, that you can do uh, to kind of help boost those, those aromatics. Um, but let's talk about another research study that we did where we looked at uh, astringency. And this one uh, was presented at ASCV a couple of years back, uh, where we looked at salivary proteins and tannins. And we found that uh, the more astringent the wine feels in your mouth, the more protein uh, your saliva is going to produce. Um, and so what was really cool was that we could correlate the perceived astringency to the amount of protein that's being produced inside the saliva. And what we did is we came up with an SPI, which stands for a salivary precipitation index. Um, so we looked at the protein tannin uh, complex and found that yes, the, the more um, astringent a wine seems or feels inside a person's mouth, the, the more uh, precipitation of these proteins will happen. We used uh, some, uh, some biochemical techniques, including SDA, SDS page, uh, which was really cool. Uh, looked at 57 different wines, uh, and we found that that SPI, that index is really good at predicting um, astringency. So with a coefficient of determination of 0.96 or 0.9, you know, 97% of the time, we were able to explain uh, astringency in a linear fashion um, so, uh, that was a really cool study and, um, was important, but, uh, what that might miss is that, um, this is a really complex system, uh, and complex systems, uh, people are complex. The wine is complex. Um, having, uh, one method for, uh, evaluating, uh, tannin, um, it's just not gonna, it's not gonna, it's not gonna take into account all of the other things that are happening. So it's important to, to utilize human tasters for the evaluation, uh, incorporate your, your staff into the winemaking process, the people in your tasting room, you know, make your bench trial solutions, get people to come in and taste the wine that, that, uh, and, and let them help you decide, uh, what it is that you know the style that that you guys are trying to develop in your winery or your or your garage or or um, or wherever you're you're making your wine. Um, so there's one thing that you kind of have to get everybody on board with. So sensory kind of brings everyone together. It brings the wine together. It's the the final steps before bottling. You do your blending. Um, sensory really ties. It really ties everything together. It brings the chemistry, the biology, um, and uh, you know the agricultural sciences, and uh, combines everything into a finished product. Um, but how do you how do you tell somebody uh, that this tastes like a fruit roll up when fruit roll ups weren't uh, they didn't exist in that country? Or uh, how do you uh, a sommelier tells you that it tastes like one thing, but you've never you've never tasted that before? So you have to kind of get everyone on the same page. And the way that you do that is that you develop a lexicon uh, or a language. Um, one great way to do that, an essential way to do that is to use the mouthfeel wheel. And so this wheel has, on the inside of the wheel, you'll see um, kind of broad descriptors. And then on the outside of the wheel, there are more specific descriptors. And utilizing this mouthfeel wheel during a tasting uh, really helps kind of get people to get on the same page. Um, and so doing that uh, will help uh, guide you and guide your sensory, uh, um, sensory analysis as you, as you go forward. Um, there are other ways to do it as well. There are touch standards for tactile sensations. So if a, if a sommelier tells you that this tastes, uh, you know, tastes like a velvet curtain or something, um, it can be difficult to imagine putting a velvet curtain in your mouth and describing how a velvet curtain feels in your mouth. 
But if you hold the, the piece of velvet in between your fingers, you can kind of imagine that, oh yes, this is much different than silk. Uh, and um, I can see that how that prickly sensation uh, has, a, has a soft under, undertone or, or, or whatever, you know, um, uh, utilizing these things uh, can kind of help get your sensory, uh, your sensory evaluation um, uh, to be, you know, kind of, you guys will all have the same attributes so that when you talk about intensity, you know that you're talking about the intensity of, of a particular attribute. Um, so UC Davis has, uh, has some tasting groups. Um, there are several universities that do this. Uh, Washington State has one as well. So, um, you know, it's important to get and taste together with it as a group uh, and to have that common language. Um, Anita Olberholster uh, offers uh, a class uh, for people to come in and taste. Um, and even, you know, if you have neighbors or um, people that work at the winery or, um, you know, if you're making wine in your garage, you know, um, contact your significant other or whatever, pull people in and, and have people taste your wine because really that's part of the fun. Um, another thing uh, that is, that is, that is uh, important to mention is how you get your dosages right. So <clears throat> let me talk last about the bench trials and how you can utilize the kit. You're gonna need some tools. You're gonna need one of these. This is a graduated cylinder. I've got some tips over here. Uh, and uh, we'll send you some of these cards. These cards are, are really great, uh, along with samples. But the kit probably cost uh, between $200 and $400. Um, it's, it's really important to, to do the trial before dumping the, the tannin into the, into the wine. Um, in many cases, it's a good idea, especially during the aging process, you know, add, add half of the, make half your addition and then kind of wait for it to integrate and see if you like it and then add the other half of your addition. Um, it's important to know that you can always add things to the wine, but you can't always remove things from, from the wine. So um, that's a, it's, it's an important thing to, to kind of think about um, as you're making your additions. Um, got the basics here for the for the bench trials. Uh, so if you want, you can take these slides and utilize them later. Um, basically, you prepare a 5% bench trial solution with the tannins by mixing two and a half grams of tannin into 50 milliliters of water. Uh, you allow it to swell for an hour and you measure out some wine samples. Uh, and then uh, you can utilize um, you can utilize these cards. Um, that we'll send to you uh, to get your dosage right. Um, but I'll include uh, I'll include the calculations for you guys um, so that you can make those calculations yourself if you wish. Um, so uh, aging tannins, uh, they like I said, they take a little while to integrate. It's best to give those two to four days before tasting them. The finishing tannins, uh, they integrate pretty much immediately, so you can taste those. Uh, at the bench pretty much right then. Uh, the calculation is at the bottom here. Um, we have the reference chart. If you need them, just contact me uh, and I'll get some sent over to you along with uh, any kind of tannin sample. Like I said, we're always looking to do more research. We love doing trials uh, with wineries and, and uh, you know, research exchanges and universities. Uh, we just really love doing uh, research and and developing those products that are going to work for people. Um, so with the finishing tannins, you don't have to you don't have to have a lot of uh, integration time, so you can taste those um, for a hundred mil sample of wine just at twenty ppm. Uh, you'd add forty microliters of that five percent bench trial solution. So um, the calculation is there at the bottom. Um, if you want to go back and look at that, uh, we can do that. Um, Reach out to us uh, if you want some some uh, trial postcards. Uh, I'll get those sent right over to you. Um, if you have any questions, you can email me. My email address is uh, the last slide here. Uh, and with that, if you guys have any questions, if you want to put the questions into the chat box, uh, I'll see if I can get these questions answered. 
And um, I want to say thanks for your time and thanks for thanks for having me. Um, let's see, it looks like we got we've got a question. Maybe not. There we go. Can I speak more about the research I'm doing with tannins and redox? We have a tendency towards reduction in our area, and we're always trying to find ways to combat it. Okay, so <clears throat> we are looking at uh, those really cool redox probes. There is a guy named the Fascinating Fungi. And uh, his real name is Gordon Walker. Uh, he's going to be at our rendezvous event speaking about um, speaking about this. So if you live on the West Coast or if you can make it to the West Coast, I'd like to personally invite you to um, rendezvous, which is uh, which is a seminar that we're giving uh, on this topic and how to utilize uh, redox probes as a process parameter to give insight into the addition um, of, of tannin. So, um, you know, uh, Gordon talks in there's you can look him up. Gordon Walker is his name. He has uh, on his website, he has recorded uh, one of his most recent seminars uh, that he gave. He did some work at Opus One over in Napa, and they looked at redox probes during uh, fermentation. So um, what they found was that there was a specific place uh, during fermentation where there was a reductive danger zone. Um, and he was able to predict a wine becoming reductive before you could actually smell the wine becoming reductive. And these probes are really, really new. Um, Roger Bolton, uh, was one of the, he wrote the book, uh, The Principles and Practices of Winemaking, great book, uh, and is considered one of the, one of the, um, um, you know, just, a, he's, a, he's an incredible uh, speaker um, and has done a lot of work with Redox, uh, but I would invite you to come out, uh, check out Gordon's um, uh, webinar, and you can find it, I think, on YouTube. Um, yeah, we're looking at we're looking at utilizing those probes as a process parameter, and we should have some some research published um, by the end of the by the end of the summer. So uh, if you can't make it to rendezvous, come to ASCV in, in 2020. I think it's uh, being held in Portland, uh, and we should have uh, some information for you there. Uh, next question: Can you suggest a tannin product that will help mask microbial flavor? Film yeast. Uh, we have a barrel under control, but we don't want to lose the wine. Um, what I would do is I would take all of the quercetin. I take the entire quercetin in line: the chalk, the intense, the sweet, and the plus. Uh, and I would look at Tancor Grand Cru. Um, if you want to send me your email address, or if you want to email me, um, I'll get some bench cards sent over to you along with. A sample of each of those tannins and then just pull some wine out and run a trial. Um, that is the best way uh, to get that to get that figured out uh, and to find a tannin that works with you. So not knowing uh, the varietal. Um, it would be it would be kind of hard, but um, definitely, uh, definitely we have something for you. Um, send me an email and I'll uh, and I'll get that over over to you immediately. Um, we'll probably have it there by the end of the week. Um, anybody, anybody else, any other questions? Okay, I am Gordon's last name. Uh, 
Gordon's last name is Gordon Walker. He's known as the fascinating fungi. He recently spoke at Cal Academy of Sciences. So he's got another webinar out there on that. And he will be at rendezvous April 21st in uh, Sonoma County and April 28th, 27th or 28th. Uh, in um in Paso Robles so you can catch him catch him there thank you guys